Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello, welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, this week we're going to talk about running injuries and how to avoid them. So many people have taken up running over the course of the last year and a half, and lots of injuries have occurred. So we're going to chat all things injuries and what to do to prevent them. Most runners will have to deal with injury at some point that can be caused by repetitive stress, but sudden injuries like a sprained ankle or torn muscle can also happen too. I'm delighted to be joined by lecturer in IT, Cardone, author of Running From Injury, Why Runners Get Injured and How to Stop It, Peter Francis. Peter, welcome to the show. How are you? Hiya, Carl. Good to be here. So listen, tell me all about the, the book. Where did the idea come from? Uh, do you run yourself? And give us a bit of background on yourself so we can get to know you. Yeah, well, I, I guess it's uh, it, it's a long story, really. But I, I was uh, a really keen runner when I was a teenager, and I got massively into it, and it motivated me to study sports science. But by the time I got to UL to study sports science, I had so many injuries that I was just uh, completely interrupted all the time. So over the next ten years, that continued on, and um, trial and error, and uh, various other science degrees and coaching and this and that and the other uh, totally fallen out of love with it and uh, I had more or less given up um, when I was about 28 and at the same time I was working on training camps with athletes in my profession and I started to be able to help them and I thought to myself maybe I could give this one more shot so um, completely new training approach um, got it together and I managed to run for three years back to back with no injuries for the first time ever. Uh, all my PBs and everything uh, got much better, broke all, all my times. And I started, a, I was on a research sabbatical in New Zealand and I started a blog to try and share this information with other runners. And then over the course of the next four years, I started to write the, the book. And then uh, in 2018, I, I finished competing um, on my own terms rather than, than due to injury. And so, yeah, I've finally gotten around now to, to packaging it all into a book and, and getting it out there. And there's nothing like experience. It's, it's the, most, the most important thing of it. You can learn everything, but you have to experience something for yourself and go through it for yourself. I'm gonna ask you about the differences in your training program in a minute, but for, first and foremost, are humans natural runners? Are we, as the famous book title suggested, born to run by Christopher McDougall or not, as the case may be? <laughs> Um, well, th there's certain features that would certainly suggest we are. So, for example, your Achilles tendon, the, the cord at the back of your heel, that's about 10 times longer in us than it is in other um, primates. And, and one of the reasons for that is it allows us to store and release energy very well. So it's, it, it would improve our efficiency as we move. Um, your bum, so the big muscles on the side of your hips, those muscles basically stop you falling over as you hop from one leg to the other because running is basically a series of kind of little jumps from one leg to the other so those muscles keep you there or another great feature would be if you ever see um somebody running with a ponytail and you'll, you'll notice if you see them from behind that the ponytail spins round and round and that's because there's a big long ligament down the back of your neck that basically allows you to hold a steady gaze with your with your head as you run. Um, and when, if you think about when we were hunter gatherers, that would have been quite advantageous to be able to run, but also to, to, to look at what you were trying to find. So um, I definitely think from a hunter gatherer perspective, which is still the body we have now, um, we, we did evolve to be able to cover long distances, both walking and, and running um, a mix of the two, you know, oh, fantastic. And Tell us about the differences between before when you were getting injured and then the different in that training program that got you, you know, running injury free for three years. Are there any kind of standalone differences that, that are, you know, really important for people to relate to? Well, I suppose, you know, the, 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 the physical evidence or the, the physical aspect is, is whether you're injured or not. But I think a big, a big breakthrough factor for me was the behavioral psychology that, sort of underpins the whole lot you know so when I first would have studied it would have been all about the biomechanics and the physiology and all of that sort of stuff but uh, knowing all of that is not much good if you don't know why you're behaving the way you behave so when I first came through um, mainly due to a lack of knowledge at the time I suppose we ran very high mileage um, so you know I, I think I write in the book when I was 17 I'd already hit 70 miles in a week so 
I was way too young uh, to be at that volume of training. But like everything, when you do a high volume of training in the short term, you get better really, really quickly. Um, so what's interesting about that is you kind of say, well, I did this crazy training here and I did a few good races. So that then becomes ingrained in your mind. OK, I need to get back to that training because that training is what gave me the good races. But of course, that training is also what gave you the injuries. <laughs> and um, if you can't train consistently, you can't improve. So um, I'd say like to, to, to kind of look at the differences, it was I found a level of training that I could do consistently and I prioritized consistency rather than volume. And to do that, I had other forms of training because another big factor with running injury is the lack of movement variability. It's a very repetitive activity. So there was a lot more strength and conditioning. There was a lot more yoga. There was a lot more time on the cross trainer. There was a lot more um, variability introduced um, uh, in a way that could be sustainable. Yeah. Okay. So looking for consistency, what you can do in the long term, whether you're a couch to 5k runner, a marathon runner, an ultra runner, that's the first thing you should look for aiming for things that you can keep going and looking at that kind of, you know, the, the getting enough rest and recovery in relative to your training. And then also that element of cross training. So to be a better runner, and presumably this applies to be a better cyclist or to be, you know, also in other sports too, you've got to mix up the training that you do. So having your strength and conditioning, having your flexibility, and then having potentially a, another thing, such as a, you know, you're saying yourself, your cross trainer, it is good to mix it up for the body as, as well. I think, yeah, you're touching on a really important concept there, Carol, in terms of um, the concepts are universal. You're, it's exactly right. So whether you're a 5K to, you know, couch to 5K runner, or whether you're, um, you know, trying to qualify for your first Olympics, or whether you're a cyclist, the concepts are the exact same, you know? So it's a case of what can I do now? Uh, what can I do now comfortably where I'm not um, completely overreaching? And how about I stick with that for the next four weeks? And that's the discipline, really. The discipline is, you know, kind of just get, getting a handle on, you know, where's my fitness at at the moment? Staying with it, not kind of getting into that temptation of, oh, I was really good last week. Let's just go up, up another week, you know? Um, and, 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 and yeah, um, adding into that variability. I mean, the other great thing about variability is when I was a runner and solely focused on runners and a lot of runners will identify with this, your only currency is running. So what happens is if you get injured, who are you? You've got nothing left, right? But when you're in a new program where there's lots of options and you do get a little niggle that you need to manage for a few days, your whole week is not derailed because you're like, oh, I've still got to do that session. Oh, and maybe I can get even better with my flexibility or my strength or so there's opportunities to improve. So you're no longer a runner, you're an athlete. It, it, it's a totally different um, mindset, you know. And you, you touched on it there, that, that mindset component, that psychological component to, you know, that can lead to injury by getting addicted to a certain type of training or getting that kind of buzz from having a really good week and not can not taking your rest and recovery time so that behavioral psychological component is really important especially especially as we get older yeah i mean it's essential and the longer i go on in all areas of the research that i do you know whether you want to uh save for retirement you know rear your kids uh run a marathon uh the ability to kind of delay gratification and be consistent, it runs through everything that's worthwhile. You know, you know, if you're writing a book, it, it, it's not about writing four chapters in a day. It's about writing a page a day and, and going from there. Yeah, absolutely. So talk me through if someone does get injured then, and this is, I, get, I get asked this all the time on the Instagram questions that we do. And every week there's people texting, you know, uh, putting questions up around, I've got an injury. What do I do? How soon do I go back? Talk me through for people listening in the, the time frame and the methodology around that. So if you do pick up an injury, say, for example, you're listening to this episode, hopefully not while you're listening to the episode, but you're out for a walk or out for a run, you feel your Achilles or you feel your hamstring tightening up a little bit and you just think, you know what, okay, that potentially could be something. Chat me through the methodology that people should be following then in terms of obviously stopping the exercise and then what, what, what should they do after that? So there's, an, there's so much in that. Um, so look there's a lot of context there's a lot of different runners a lot of different injuries but um the first thing i would say is if we start with the niggle um is don't panic um right so a lot of niggles are just niggles and 
they will go away themselves and they will be fine. And maybe you don't even need to do a whole lot. I think I think sometimes we're a little bit information overload in society nowadays, which means I felt this tightness, which means I've got this and that. And, and then next minute we're getting MRI scans and all sorts of stuff when we when we really don't need to. So um, if you've got a niggle, I would say um, don't 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 panic. Now, if that niggle is getting worse, so you know, if something is kind of less than a four out of 10 pain and not causing you too much trouble, I don't think you need to worry. But let's say that's getting progressively worse. The sooner you stop, the sooner you get back. So that's that's what I would say is 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 chill out. Uh, try and do some other forms of training um, get to know your body and um, monitor it uh, over time. So, I mean, that's yeah, because because running injuries, they're unusual in that they come on slowly. They're kind of insidious in nature. Um, people will have little niggles that don't cause them too much trouble and can, and can train quite well. But I've found over the years that there's a threshold of, listen, if you're getting to that four out of 10, uh, you probably need to, to adjust and do something else. And is rice still, because you know, when, when I was in college, did my sports science and sports management degree, it was all about rice, you know, rest, size, mm. compression. Is that still the go-to methodology to bring people through an injury? Um, it's it's actually evolved quite a lot. I mean, there was a new one um, in 2013 called um, Police. Um, and Police was the idea of uh, protecting it initially, so maybe when you stop running. Um, but then the OL was optimal loading. So the, the whole idea is that um, you don't just stop. Um, and I think that's really important. Again, when we go back to that cross-training idea, the trouble when you stop is that everything stops. And so then you start to kind of decondition in other areas and then you nearly invite an injury onto yourself when you get when you do get back. So um, I think the maximum amount of loading that you can do is important. And then the, the, the ICE is the, is the same as, as it was before. They've even um, there's a newer one now. I can't remember the acronym, but they've actually um, put in something to do with education and sort of um, the emotional part of it and understanding pain. Um, and kind of not getting freaked out by it, you could say. So it has evolved a bit, but yeah, some of those principles are still fine, yeah. And with lockdowns and people, and I've noticed myself in terms of working from home, all of a sudden I'm not commuting into the gym, I'm not walking from my car space to the gym, I'm not walking out to get lunch, I'm just moving, I'm you now I'm aware of it, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm moving more because of that, but generally people are moving less. And in terms of reducing injury, increasing your walking, increasing your movement is a really important thing on a day-to-day -day level, just to keep the body functioning and keeping the body moving generally. 100%, I think you're touching there on one of the major causes of running injuries. So if we, if we think about our original uh, conversation, which was that, we still have the body of the hunter gatherer we still um you know evolved to be able to run but modern living even pre-pandemic um it's so sedentary now that even you know really high level amateur athletes are are essentially sedentary the rest of the time so you're asking your poor body then to go from nothing to a flat out 10k at six o'clock after work um, you know, it's quite cruel when you think about it. You kind of you're going from that seated, cramped position, and then saying, you know, I want to move um, like a you know a, a Kenyan runner uh, through the streets, you know. And um, yeah, it's it's very difficult. And I think one of the reasons injuries are so high in running is that we're no longer as conditioned as we were for it. And I think conditioning comes from walking to your car, comes from um, you know maybe alternating at a standing desk comes from you know and there's other there's other parts to it too in terms of we move less but we also move less variably so you know you don't have to climb a fence much nowadays you don't have to you know um run through make your way through a forest or or climb a tree or you know especially kids and that so um there's less movement variability now as well which also feeds into to our lack of conditioning so i think that's a major issue with uh, with running injuries yeah Great. Folks, you're listening to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. We're chatting all things injuries with Peter Francis. Peter, uh, a common question that always comes in um, when you were coming coming on the show, I, I put it aside to ask, ask you, treadmill versus road in terms of running, which is better, which, is, which reduces your injury risk? <laughs> 
It's a horrible Amen. question. I know, but I, I, I thought I thought I put it to you when I when I came in over the weekend on on, uh, on Instagram. <laughs> um, I think I think there it just depends on um, probably what what I love to do with uh, groups um, is always to try and get them away from the the object of their concern. So, for example, is it this running shoe or is it that treadmill or is it the road? And say. Let's just think about the loading for a second. So um, we know that you're going to get a running injury if you change anything too quickly. So that's why we had this conversation at the start where we said, you know, let's let's have a realistic appraisal of where we are now and let's not change anything um, too quickly. So that's the first thing. You'll get an injury. If you've run on a treadmill your whole life and you've never had a problem, chances are you're going to be fine. Um, but if you do, if you're that type of runner and you suddenly say, I'm going to start road running, your body's going to be like, whoa, what, what happened here? Okay, vice versa, if you've been all your life running on the road, no problems, and you decide, you know what, I'm sick of being outside, I'm going to go on the treadmill, that's going to be a sudden change. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, the, the, if I had to pick a side, I would pick the road, uh, simply because running is low enough on movement variability as it is, um, without going on to a treadmill is the first reason. And the second reason is the treadmill brings your leg back for you, which means you don't have to. And anytime we are not using our bodies fully, we're not really going to use all the muscles that we need to use. So a treadmill for me is very, very low on movement variability, doesn't require to use your body to its full extent. Um, so if I was picking a side, um, yeah, I would probably say the road. But again... So that's you know, a really good scientist answer. I love it. It's so it makes such sense when you and again you just talk it through, make it really straightforward, and it's a, you know it's a really good answer. But again, and also like we were talking about earlier on, you know, mixing it up. So for example, in the summer it's really easy to run on the road. In the winter, especially if I live at the countryside, uh, road running at six o'clock is not quite the thing to do because there's no footpaths. So treadmill, you know, you can see mixing it up between the two can work. Just don't shock the body with anything drastically different than what you're what you're currently. Which brings me yeah. nicely to my next question, which is barefoot running. Yeah. was a big thing years ago. I, I read the book, I went straight out and bought a set of Vibrams and I started barefoot running and I was intrigued by it. What's your take on it? Um, well, do you know what? Barefoot running was actually the source of my entire uh, science career because what happened was after I did my sports science degree in UL, I went to the Middle East and I was teaching English for a year. And I was still riddled with all the injuries. And I had this really nasty one that some of your listeners might know, um, plantar fasciitis. Oh, and yeah. yeah, really painful in the heel for anybody that doesn't know. And, and, and particularly sore on your first few steps in the morning. So I had previously had that and I would had all the fancy treatment and it take, took months and cost me a fortune and all that. And in the Middle East, of course, I didn't have access to these options. And a friend of mine at home just sent me an article saying, oh, have you seen this thing about barefoot running? So I went to the only uh, grass park in the country where they put a million litres of water on it a day just to keep it, keep it going, right? I took off my shoes and I ran for 15 minutes and I said, okay, that didn't feel too bad, but I was like, oh, it's only 15 minutes. I was like, I'm still a bit sceptical. So I took a day off and I went back again and I repeated the procedure and my pain was gone. And I thought, whoa, this is interesting. So um, particularly having had it before and knew how long it, it took to go away. So I came back to UL to study my PhD and I said to my professor, this happened to me in the Middle East and I really want to do something about this. Uh, I think it's fascinating. And he was kind of skeptical. He rolled his eyes like professors do and was like, oh yeah, sure, you know, whatever, good idea. Um, but to be fair to him, he did um, allow me mentor one of his undergraduate students to do a project. And that was the first project we ever did. We took the arm off the treadmill. We had the runners from the athletics club come in they ran with them without their shoes and we found they ran differently and um, particularly at the, at the lower speeds um, and it sort of has rolled on from there so in, we're doing a lot of different studies on it and, and we have done over the years but um, in my own career it was a, a game changer it was one of the many things along with the behavioral psychology and everything else um, that really helped I mean I'm six foot four um, a big guy in a cushion shoe hitting the ground hard is, is not a good recipe. Um, so when I transitioned to barefoot running, which, by the way, is mainly on grass or a medium firm sand surface, I think that's an important aspect of this conversation. Um, 
It, it was massive. Yeah, it, it, it helped me a lot. I mean, I, I was up to, um, before I finished competing, I was up to 20 miles at sub three hour marathon pace. Um, barefoot. Barefoot on the grass. I worked, I was working in Leeds at the time. So um, lovely big uh, grass park in Leeds. And um, yeah, so I mean, my, 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 my overall barefoot is my kind of research area. But what I would say my overall is kids need to be barefoot as much as possible. Um, uh, and if not barefoot minimalist, um, they will have healthier, stronger feet and tendons and everything else um, as a result. Adults can benefit from it as well. But again, we're back to our uh, treadmill road conversation where it's a case of take your time, transition, your foot is in a shoe a lot longer than a kid's, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, amazing. So folks, if you're listening in, try that, you know, try a little bit of barefoot walking, maybe to start with, see how it feels. And then if you want to build it up from there, certainly do. As ever, with regards to the podcast, we're trying to bring you information, content, tips, tools, try it, see what works for you and see what doesn't. If you have any concerns, don't forget to check it out with a registered physiotherapist or somebody like that, just in case you need to. But I, it's something I do. I walk, my wife has always given out to me. I walk around the house barefoot. I walk around the garden barefoot. Uh, I do a little bit of barefoot running. Not, I do like my gel Cayados. I will, I, I won't lie, but I do walk barefoot as much as I possibly can. And I do think it's really, really important. Peter, if people want to find out more about you and find out uh, where the book is, where can they get it? Uh, it's all at peterfrancis.blog. Amazing. So folks, check it out there. Everything that you need to know is going to be in Peter's book, Peter Francis at blog, and you can check it out from now. As ever, that's another episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Lay Healthcare. You know where we are, at Carl Henry PT on Twitter and on Instagram, Real Health and Independent.ie. And if you liked what you heard, don't forget to rate and review. We'll see you next week for more Real Health. Lay Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.